Norma Marcia Kavanaugh, thanks so much for joining us. Well, we begin with a prediction that neither Barack Obama nor Bobby Jindal will be elected governor tomorrow, though their names have been part of the debate perhaps more often than the actual candidates. We'll look tonight at the long, contentious campaign in which super PACs ruled and the truth often suffered. We'll also look at other key elections and at one exit from the ballot as Bobby Jindal ended his quest for the presidency. Our Future Watch segment examines the status of the new VA hospital and checking the pulse for us are tonight's Informed Sources. Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. Jeremy Alford, publisher, lapolitics.com. Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter. And Stephanie Grace, a columnist, the New Orleans advocate. Okay, the time has come just about. Tomorrow, Election Day. Governor, let's take a look at that first. Um, what to say? Uh, the, 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 the week started with a debate. We have polls, polls, polls. Uh, ads, ads, more ads. ads than any of us ever want to see again. Um, so let's start, Jeremy, with you. Yeah, this is it. The Thrilla in Manila, the Rumble in the Jungle, mm -hmm. the premier Louisiana election governor. It ends tomorrow night. Uh, David Vitter on one side, uh, a polished D.C. politician and arguably one of, the, one of the most flawed statewide Republican candidates in recent history. Uh, he has made it through controversies about prost prostitutes and private eyes <clears throat> to enter this week with white voters returning back home to David Vitter. Will it be enough to make it through tomorrow? We we'll have to wait and see. On the other side is John Bell Edwards, who's running a very grassroots, very rural campaign, and who has, quite frankly, history working against him. Uh, no statewide Democrat elected in seven years. Uh, you know, it, it, is, it has come down to this week, and as we also saw in the two televised debates, both of these men were primed for confrontation. That's what we saw. And, uh, you know, it, it all comes down to influence and voice. And will David Vitter win out his argument that John Bell Edwards is an Obama Democrat, a liberal Democrat? Or will voters believe John Bell Edwards when he says David Vitter has a character flaw? He represents four to eight more years of Bobby Jindal. Uh, the tracking polls have just been dumped on us over, the, over this past week. And we have seen a slow, gradual progression of white registered Democrats, white independents that traditionally vote Republican, and then those crossover Republican votes moving back to David Vitter. Uh, you know, I think this was bound to happen, but it also happens in the wake of this Syrian refugee issue. So the question is, would it would have happened anyway? Or did the Syrian refugee issue do the, the heavy lifting? Right. And that's been such an interesting issue because it allowed David Vitter to really go on offense with his argument that linking John Bell Edwards with the president. And it's put John Bell Edwards really on defense for the first time. Mm -hmm. He's really had to run ads and do a lot of robocalls. I mean, I've gotten three of them saying, you know, I don't share the president's position. I actually share David Vitter's position. And that's not a place he wants to be in this last week. So as much as David Vitter has tried, do voters really buy that there's that direct of a link between John Bell Edwards from a meet Louisiana who's a member of the state house representatives right. and, and, and the president. Well, I would, you know, go. These, he's been saying that from the beginning of the runoff campaign, and and you know, for a very long time, the polls were, you know, still gave John Bell Edwards a very big advantage. So I feel like it's a limited argument. I feel like maybe it appeals to the people who are going to be with him anyway. They're really ideological yeah. voters. And, and um, I, I, yeah, I think people do believe it. But is it enough to sway them? I, I don't think it's showing up it doesn't in doesn't matter for a governor versus a senator, where clearly well, it does matter. Well, this is like from the playbook of the Bill Cassidy campaign it's, against Mary Landrieu. Which was David Vitter's playbook. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And some people say it was unfair then, too, but at yeah. least it made a little bit more sense. It did. Because, because it was national politics. Yeah, and it was yeah, about yeah, the balance Mary of power Landrieu in the Senate. Mary was a senator in Washington sure. dealing with national issues. Yeah. But a state representative from a mate, I mean, he's not going to have a lot of interaction. Well, that's, well, that's why there was a pivot late in the campaign to start saying, hey, you voted for a majority of Bobby Jindal's budgets, which most lawmakers do. I mean, yeah. I think Karen Carter Peterson is probably the most consistent no vote at the Capitol, but he's voted against a couple of them, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think it was five um, of eight. Yeah. Peter has been saying, which means not three. Yeah. So. You know, but, <clears throat> I think. Excuse me. 
a new factor in analysis. Like it used to be like a day before the election, you were looking at polls. But now that early voting is becoming mm -hmm. a bigger thing, that there is some analysis just based on early voting trends, which isn't the same thing as a, as a poll. But if you see enough of a certain thing happening, yeah. then maybe people start concluding some things. And the, um, the, the Wall Street Journal uh, blog today did an analysis of Louisiana's early voting, which ended Saturday. And they found out that there was a, a higher number of Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which, which, which would be a, a good sign for Edwards, and a higher number of, of women mm -hmm. who tend to vote more Democratic and, and in Louisiana tend to, to not like Vitter. And there's been a real gender gap all along in this race. Yeah, yeah. and they, they also, you know, there's also more voters participating from urban areas, exactly. which favors John Bell Edwards, which brings me to. I think the most interesting thing, and the biggest difference between the primary and the runoff is going to be the uh, field operation for John mm -hmm. Bell Edwards. In the primary, there was none. Mm -hmm. For this runoff, there's definitely a fully funded, well-equipped uh, field operation. Uh, the Democratic Governors Association and Scott Arsenault, the executive director of the Florida Republican Party, used to be the Louisiana ED, is the tip of the spear for this operation. And you could tell that through early voting, they really put their GOTV operation into play and is primed and ready for tomorrow. They got 5,000 door knockers ready to go. They got phone operations in every major metro area. Uh, they're focusing on Baton Rouge, uh, Shreveport, and New Orleans, obviously, but there's also a big push for these rural areas to get voters out there. Uh, John Bell Odors carried 23 rural parishes. Mary Lander did not. Sheriffs have endorsed him. The majority of assessors have. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. There's usually not that much of a rural outreach, but there's also Louisiana's Family First, a super PAC run by uh, uh, State Senator Ben Nevers dropped $320,000 last week just for Saturday. Canvassers, phones, direct mail. So this is a, this is a combined effort, but also the teachers unions, mm -hmm. Louisiana Federation of Teachers, Louisiana Associated Ed Educators, for the first time have pulled their resources for turnout. So we're going to see what that looks like for the very first time ever right. in Louisiana politics tomorrow. It is a massive effort on and, the Democratic and one side. One more effort, one more piece of it that goes statewide is the sheriffs, the courthouse crowd, as you've yeah. written, the, you know, straight troopers. I mean, they're with John Bell Edwards, too. And of course, they have people who are often very strong in some of these small parishes. Obviously, John Bell Edwards' brother is one of them. He's the sheriff of Tangipahoa Parish. So we entered this week with John Bell uh, Edwards ahead in the polls. What are we seeing now? Is it tightening up pretty much? It's tightening up over the past 48 hours, down to some suggest a single digit lead, but I can tell you that, that as of midday Wednesday, the um, average margin for John Bell Edwards was plus 13.5. Uh, you know, I've seen some studies here recently where they looked at the polling averages versus the election results over the past uh, 11 years, and those m margins are usually off by four points. So even if it was off by four points, he'd still, still be nine and a half. Nine and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, you know, it's hard to dispense with the fundamentals of statewide politics and the whole mystique about David Vitter and mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I think this is just going to be a really interesting one to watch. I think everyone, every political professional in the state is taking notes right now from right. both sides on this race. I just find it ironic that after the serious sin, the la mm -hmm. like, he was reelected, and the, yeah. the public seemingly in, forgave in or forgot. Very and, nationalized elections, though. in a huge yes. election, and for it to come back up and yeah. make the di be perhaps the difference maker is kind of surprising. Well, I think in that reelection campaign, we learned that it takes more than one sex scandal to sink a Louisiana politician. Uh -huh. But <laughs> this time around, we've learned that. The governor's race is a very personal race to right, voters here. Right, And there have been other scandals. I mean, this, the spying scandal. Mm -hmm. right. the, and really, you know, you said the mystique of David Vitter, and he really does have that as someone who's really kind of a master strategist and also kind of a bully, some people would say. You know, if you're not with him, he's going to punish you, people think. And the fact that so many people are coming out of the woodwork to criticize him now, I think <laughs> that's been there all this time. These are like political insiders, and they just really haven't spoken up. They're speaking up now. I mean, you know, people in Jefferson Parish that he served with years ago, Noel Norman, obviously, Lauren Shahardi put out a very strongly worded endorsement. He's another Republican, the former assessor, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of parish officials are with John Bell Edwards, even though they're Republicans. And, and look, uh, kind of playing off of that theme, yeah. the whole Syrian refugee issue, there is no stronger emotion in politics than fear. Exactly. And David Vitter has been able to leverage it uh, quite skillfully in, in direct mail and TV and, and everything but, else. But you know, when it first happened, uh, I hate to reduce that tragedy like that to, to politics, but, but still it's a factor. Uh, I, th I thought that, that 
that might bounce back in Edwards' favor because usually the times of a national tragedy, people tend to galvanize behind the president. And here you've had for months, mm -hmm. okay, Vitter saying Obama, 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 linking him to Edwards and, and then the president having a chance to really look presidential. But then the way the week unfolded yeah. with the president's response on things, uh, it, it was more of material for Vitter to play off right. of him. So it, to me, it didn't work out like it, well, I, I, I if, thought it would. I wonder if that's because it really wasn't an American tragedy. It was a French tragedy, and we're obviously very sympathetic, but it's not something that... You know, yeah. it kind of was easier to <coughs> politicize from afar, probably, and it became very yeah. caught up in the presidential race immediately. And look, since, since the since the early '70s, only one governor has been elected from the same party of the sitting president, and that was Poppy Jindal. Everyone else has always been elected from the opposite party of the sitting president. Okay, turnout tomorrow. What is predicted? Forty-two percent, according to Secretary of State Tom Shedler. Um, it's this will be the third time since 1991 that runoff uh, turnout exceeded the preceding primary turnout. It happened one time with uh, Duke Edwards and increased by 700,000 votes. Bobby Jindal's second election increased by half a percentage point. So this will be the third time since 1991 has happened, if it does. What are some key areas of the state? When we're watching the results come in, what sections of the state are really kind of yeah. give us an idea of what's going, really so, going so on? So Baton Rouge has benefited from the most gross rating points in terms of media buys this week, followed by Lafayette, which I think is a major swing region, mm -hmm. large Acadiana, but uh, also Monroe. Uh, Region uh, David Vitter has uh, has got to try to replicate the 2010 and 2014 turnouts in that area, uh, but also especially for David Vitter, uh, <coughs> St. Tammany. The St. Tammany region is somewhere where a Republican can overperform. Uh, he's got to do better than he did in the primary there and, and really turn out the vote. That was the heart of the turnout operation for Bill Cassie last year, and this is more or less the same team overseeing uh, GOTB. Interesting that. The RNC, Republican National Committee, usually comes down here and helps Republicans with data, turnout, um, but David Vitter's doing it all in-house. This is something I'm told that he likes to get involved with personally, so there's no interaction with the state party, there's no interaction with the RNC. David Vitter has cr cultivated this reputation as a lone wolf, and we're seeing that again with turnout. When we see these uh, TV spots, the ones that are financed by a super PAC, and they, the, I mean, they could turn them around, I mean, in, in seconds almost. I mean, they respond to an issue. <coughs> Who are these people that are doing this, and, and where are they done? And isn't there like, like, like a national formula that they're applying to these? It's, well, they're, um, some of the super PACs are linked very closely with candidates. David Vitter has had one that's basically run by one of his former aides. Um, outside media firms, obviously. The one that we've seen a lot of in this cycle is called Gumbo Pack, and that's, you know, they've been around since the beginning, the primary. Um, some trial lawyers funded them. They did those anybody but Vitter um, billboards. What's happened in the runoff is, now that National Democrats see that this is a winnable race, they've gotten involved and they've put a lot of money into Gumbo Pack. So that's, that's kind of a, Demo those are Democratic ads against Vitter. But they don't say that. They don't say that. Voters mm -hmm. watching on TV wouldn't necessarily know that because it says this ad is paid for by Gumbo Pack, mm -hmm. which I think is probably very good for them. Okay, okay. We, need to, we need to jump over to the lieutenant governor's race right now. Stephanie, sure. I'm going to have you take the lead on that. We have just a couple okay. of minutes now to talk about that. Okay. How are we looking? Uh, we probably only need a couple of minutes mm -hmm. to talk about it because all the drama in the governor's race, there ain't none on the mm -hmm. lieutenant governor's race. Um, you've seen some ads on TV from Billy Nungesser, really not from Kip Holden. You know, Nungesser the Republican, Kip Holden the Democratic mayor of Baton Rouge, hasn't run much of a campaign. You know, he, he was the only Democrat on the ballot, so that got him a runoff spot. And you know, all signs point to Billy Nungesser, who, of course, is the former Plaquemines Paris, Parish president, but developed a larger reputation back during the BP oil spill, got a lot of media exposure mm -hmm. statewide and national. And, um, you know, lieutenant governor, it's about tourism, it's about marketing, it's not necessarily about the thing that gets the things that get people excited, although you have to realize that You're that person's a heartbeat, a heartbeat away. away. So it is pretty important. Right. So, I mean, will turnout really have a, an impact here, do you feel, more so maybe even than the governor's race? I mean, I don't think the lieutenant, you know, there were people who were hoping, Democrats I know, who were hoping that perhaps Kip Holden's um, appearance on the ballot in Bat might drive turnout in Baton Rouge. I don't think that. I think this is all driven by the governor's race. And any yeah. big differences between the two? Or I mean, that would be noticed or marketing. Been able to tell? Uh, 
One's a Democrat, one's a Republican, so they have yeah. the kind of general philo philosophical I'll differences. I'll say this, being lieutenant but... governor is going to be a different role for both of them. Yeah. Because they're going to be working on tourism, yeah. right? I, mean, I, mean, I mean, which is a whole different world, and, and they're, they're really trying to promote themselves based on that. But that's always, that's, well, that's, that's been one of the weird things about the lieutenant yeah. governor's race, is that your job, other than waiting for the governor to resign, is, 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 is to market tourism, yeah. but yet, the people who get elected, that tends not to be their expertise. Right, and they tend to be very ambitious people. Right. Right. Um, well, we heard this week now from our governor yeah. um, that he's given up his bid yeah. to run for president. Daryl, let you take the lead on that one. Well, you know, when the United States Constitution was written, you know, they talked about the Electoral College as a method of electing a president. So they talked about the presidency in that sense. They never talked about political parties, and they never had a word about how the political parties would get their nominees to run. And that process is still evolving. We're still trying to figure that out. I mean, if you go from time to time to time, I mean, I mean, it's continually changing. I think what's really become different over the last couple of election cycles is the impact of, uh, of cable TV, which has created this, this attention to the the nominees of the parties way early into the, into the system, like a, a year before, and has created the party political debate. And so now if you want to run for president, you've got to, first of all, be someone that's going to get recognition in a hurry. And I think that's part of the problem that Bobby Jindal had, and a lot of people have had, that they just couldn't get any attention. And Jindal's from a small state, but you had people like George Pataki from New York State and Rick Perry from Texas. They couldn't get attention either. So a lot of prominent people, and so part of it is, well, well how do you get attention? Uh, you, you know, if only four people would have run for the Republican nominee, there could have been room for Jindal at the table. But when you had, I don't know how many there were at the beginning. 17. Uh, okay, so, yeah. uh, maybe 17. And so how do you get it? Well, how do you... Uh, you You'd be a Donald Trump type person, or or or, or 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 Cruz, or somebody like that who's just able to be photogenic or controversial, or or some sort of way. And Jindal was just never able to get that attention at all, and it well, was going nowhere. One of the things he did was he tried to jump into, he tried to jump on. Donald Trump's mm -hmm. controversy and engage with him directly, and Donald Trump kind of swatted him away. Yeah, he, he also put a lot of his eggs in one basket with yeah. Iowa, but yeah. he, I don't think he ever quite figured out who he is. You know, he yeah. started out as, a, as the smartest guy in the room, and then he went to someone who made these kind of crazy statements to yeah. grab headlines and become relevant. And you know, it, and the other thing, of course, is the debates. He there were four Republican debates. He never got mm -hmm. onto the main stage for any of them, and that definitely sends a signal to voters and to funders. These are the real candidates. These are the ones you don't have to worry about. People didn't get a chance this, to see them. Exactly. This 1% factor is something new in American politics, it but it's a big thing. You know, that the networks came up with the idea, well, if you're not pulling 1%, right. then you don't get into the debate. And the crazy thing is so, so many of these people were within the margin of error. It wasn't statistically significant, these differences. Right. So. And, so, and, it, and so once you get the reputation as being someone who's not a 1%er, yeah. you know, it's not the main debate, then it's, it's even... Uh, a deeper hole to dig out of, and he was really just never, yeah. never able to get out of that. Well, was it a surprise that he pulled out? I mean, wasn't um, it expected that he would at least stick it out through Iowa? Yes, because Iowa tends to be somewhat inexpensive to compete in, and money was one of his big problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were some signs he was making some inroads there. You know, he, it's a very... numbers were going up They were going up. Iowa. I mean, they weren't breaking up to mm -hmm. the, getting up to the top. For but, Iowa. Uh, it's not very... Not, not for not Iowa. Sure. Yeah. But he's built for Iowa. I mean, it's very much a place where religious conservatives dominate the process. It's very face-to-face. -face. He's very good campaigning face-to-face, -face, as bad as he can be on TV. Um, you know, again, the big question is why this week? And the mm -hmm. fact that he showed up in the middle of the last week of the governor's race has caused all yeah. kinds of intrigue. Well, well, you, <laughs> yes. A good thing about his making the decision this week is that after tomorrow, there's going to be a new character in town called yeah. the governor-elect, yeah. and nobody's going to be paying much attention right. to him. Except and so, he's going on a farewell tour, he right, said, right. so he's going to And so trying. he only has a little bit of time left to be gubernatorial. Yeah. So I think he, I th I think he realized that, that now's the time to judge. But you know, even if he had caught hold, it, it was unfortunate that this was happening at the same time that there was a gubernatorial election back in his home state, and he was taking a beating back in his home state. So had he become a serious candidate, the national media would have been reporting about what's going on in Louisiana, and I don't think he'd have survived mm -hmm. that either. So. One thing that happened when he came back, of course, they had to, the legislature, the budget committee, joint budget committee had to vote on big cuts today. Um, 
John Bell Edwards and David Vitter basically came out against the governor's plan. The governor shot back and said, fine, show me your own plan. And there's been some real sniping back and forth, really, between the governor's staff and Vitter on Twitter. You know, all the tension that we've all known about for a long time is breaking out in the open. And the committee did pass. They did pass plan. the mm -hmm. governor's proposal out right. of, you know, and they said fear of cutting higher ed more. Right. And it's true. Nobody has presented an alternate plan. Right. So real that's, quick, what's the future for Bobby Jindal in politics? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, <clears throat> he says he's going back to his nonprofit, um, but uh, you know who knows? I mean, it, it, he could have a say in this upcoming uh, U.S. Senate race if uh, David Vitter does not win tomorrow and somehow, for some reason, decides not to run this year. Uh, General would uh, get to make that appointment, but I don't think uh, David Vitter is eager to give him that Christmas present. I think his best hope is for a Republican to be elected president and, 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 and to get a cabinet yeah. appointment in the Republican mm -hmm. administration. Okay, let's go over to Don now, our future watch. I'm talking about the, yes, a little bit. Talk about the VA hospital. What's going on well, over there? Well, the VA hospital is the second of the two big, big hospitals in the downtown area. Um, we have not had a VA hospital in New Orleans since Hurricane Katrina, but there are plenty of veterans still seeking veteran care, VA care. There are actually 42,000 people actively using the VA system across the state. It's in a 23 parish region that the VA supports. 66,000 veterans enrolled in that program and the VA administration expects by the time the new hospital actually opens there will be more than 70,000 veterans mm -hmm. using the system and they hope to return to a fully functional destination hospital. Before Katrina, the VA hospital was a cardiac center of excellence in the nation, which meant veterans from Florida to Alabama to Texas came to New Orleans for treatment. And the hope is that that's what this new facility will return to the community. Um, they say about 85% of the construction is complete at this point, and the very first building to get delivered, as I told you all before the show, are turned over so that they can start, you know, they'll get the keys to it, the mm -hmm. contractors will leave, the VA takes over and starts moving in equipment and starts training people in there. Around January, the inpatient tower will be turned over to the VA. Then around mid-year, um, the outpatient tower will come in, and then by September, October, the rest of the facility, which would be the emergency room, the diagnostic center, the pharmacy, and the laboratories, all that will be ready. It takes a long time to put furniture and equipment and get all the training done, um, but they expect to see the very first patients before the end of 2016. And the hospital's built, I'm told, much like you build a house, the first room that's finished is the last room you use, which is your attic, actually. That's the first room that's finished mm -hmm. off. The last rooms that are done when you're building a house are your bathrooms and your kitchen, and they're the first rooms you need. Same way with this hospital, the way it's built, they won't actually have their inpatient facility done, and it, it'll be one of the last things to open. Mm -hmm. So slowly but surely, they'll, they'll start taking outpatients and then outpatient surgery surgery patients who need a little bit more and need a place to stay maybe for a little bit a few more hours and then by June or August of 2017 they'll be full on taking the more acute care patients the more serious surgeries in the meantime the biggest push right now is hiring mm -hmm. they, they opened the Pan American building Pan American life building last year around this time to st act as a hiring center because there are still the VA centers all around they have full staff for those patients that they're seeing now, but they're going to need a thousand more people. Um, doctors, nurses, x-ray techs, pharmacists, you name it. And the question I asked is, if, if you were talking to a high school student or a college student right now, what would you tell them? Go into health care. The jobs will mm -hmm. be a plenty. Um, this is not a competition system with the University Medical Center across the street. In fact, the two hospitals will work in tandem. Um, the director of the VA hospital told me, you know, we anticipate seeing some of our patients actually walk across the street mm -hmm. and go for radiation oncology care. We're not going to do exactly the same thing. It's a waste of resources. We're going to share resources. They also have partnerships with the medical schools and the other programs. So really not open fully until 2017. Fully until 2017. And how many beds oh, gosh. Do you, I do not know how many beds. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but you, but you were pointing out before that New Orleans is one of the few cities. New Orleans is one of only 29 cities in the United States that has two medical schools. We have LSU and Tulane. Mm -hmm. And that really is... a, a 
boon for mm -hmm. these hospitals to have the training, the partnerships, the internships available, and then be able to, once people are adequately right. trained and finished with school, be able to pull them on in and hire them. So the hope, obviously, we've talked about here is to make this a medical destination, both for veterans right. and others. And if all goes well, it looks like this new one billion dollar mm -hmm. facility will help along the way with that. And by 2017, we'll have two, two fully big, functioning huge, medical centers yes. there on Tulane between Tulane and Canal. And all the bio biomedical things yeah. that go along it's with It's growing. Them. It definitely is. Okay, one more shot at politics. Yes. Real quick, we just have about a minute and a half now. Uh, Attorney General, what's looking? So two weeks ago, it looked like uh, Attorney General, the incumbent, Buddy Caldwell, was going to be holding on to this seat. Trending poll, poll trends were in his favor. Uh, but boy, this one has taken a sharp turn over the last week. The polling trends show Jeff Landry with a leg up on this thing. And, uh, you know, Buddy Caldwell actually went dark on TV from Monday to Monday over the past week, uh, put all of his money into uh, canvassing and on the streets. It created a last minute fundraising panic. You could see in special reports this week. And they bought back in for just a 48 hour run on Tuesday morning. So uh, this, this is going to look like the, the tough one. And this will be the second. Attorney General, <clears throat> incumbent Attorney General, if the polling trends hold, that voters have toppled uh, since uh, Charlie Foti. What is Hurt Caldwell? What has undermined him in this race? Well, I think that, that he was he, he had gotten crossways with the business community, uh, Chemical Association, uh, Bobby Jindal, the legislature. Uh, he got some really nasty headlines over the, the, the VP, BP legal contracts, over these contingency fee contracts. And uh, this is just an office that, that voters are used to seeing some turnover in. And uh, Jeff Landry came at him from the right and um, raised a, a good deal of money and, and mounted a campaign as, as more or less what we used to call a Tea Party candidate. Right. And, yeah. and, and just outmaneuvered him. Some Democrat. And again, it's one of these Republican versus Republican races where the Democrats are the swing voters often. Right. And people, I think, thought Caldwell, a former Democrat, would get most of them. Well, I think okay. Andrew's getting yeah, some. And is. now I have to cut off political discussion. Yes. We need to look ahead <laughs> and then wrap up the show. Errol. Well, whoever wins tomorrow can start packing for the mansion right away because Inauguration Day is January 11th, so it's mm -hmm. going to be a fairly brief uh, transition period. In Law B, the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry has already booked the winner, whichever it is, mm -hmm. uh, for their annual meeting on, on January 14th. Okay, right. Jeremy. Uh, David Vitter wins, David Vitter loses, it doesn't matter. The big political story starting Sunday morning is the 2016 U.S. Senate race. Ton of names already being floated for this race. It's going to be fascinating. I can't mm -hmm. wait. Okay, Don. Last year, Luna Feet came to New Orleans for the first time. It was on Gallier Hall. It's a really cool light show. It's coming back again the first weekend in December, but it's going to be at the Ashe Cultural Center this Okay. Time. All right. On Aretha Castle Haley. Yes. Okay. Okay. Stephanie. And again, we have a very tight transition. Everybody's going to take a break for Thanksgiving and come back. The big story in December, I think, is going to be whoever's elected governor, who's around them, who are the key staff people, who are the key legislative leaders. A lot of jockeying. We kind of have an idea with Vitter, maybe less so with Edwards. That could be really interesting. All right. Thank you guys for being here. Remember, tomorrow's Election Day. Go vote. And, of course, we hope that everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll see you again next Friday for Informed Sources. Thanks for joining us. Bye.